So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, in fact, just a little correction. This project is uh, a sort of a, a multi-hemisphere project that uh, I did this year and partly last year. It started, in fact, about two, three years ago, but it was Montreal, not Toronto, the other city in Canada, yeah. <laughs> um, so to, to begin with, I will talk about the dome as a new medium of exploration for sound and for composition, but also for sound projection. But in this case, as a recording medium for a solo instrument, the piano. First of all, what is an immersive performance? We can think of the famous term Gesamtkunstwerk, or total artwork, which refers to an artistic creation that synthesizes all elements of music, song, drama, performance, art, dance, and this was usually performed on a large uh, stage, in an opera, in a large hall, uh, perhaps even in an amphitheater, like 2,000 years ago. But the principle was always the same, was to unite all types of uh, art forms. Other famous examples include Il Duomo, the Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, which was especially a place to revere God, uh, provide a sublime ideal environment for reflection, art, and create a connection with the universe through sounds of the pipe organ, the sounds of the choir. Ideal space for ecclesiastic music performance as well. The structure, if you think about it, is actually 44 meters diameter and sits on a structure of 54 meters high. So I just want you to remember these numbers for a little while. This takes us to the progress, so to speak, in the future, creating actual domes, like the wonder of Jena in Germany, and a place which is closer to the project I'm about to present. This dome, in fact, is 23 meters in diameter. So there's a difference, and it sits on ground level. <laughs> but it has a different purpose. The Duomo didn't have any speakers. It had artwork. Here, this planetarium or this new type of um, immersive environment may have speakers, up to perhaps 100, 120 speakers in integrated in the actual structure. So this is the place where, in fact, I started to think about the project. The project where, um, in fact, about two years ago, um, exactly two years ago, in fact, to May 22nd, 2014, I took part in a uh, full dome festival. I was uh, one of um, one of 100 contribu contributions of 20 nations for the eighth full dome festival. And this is where, in fact, something came closer to my attention that perhaps instead of simply having projections, uh, films, or static, a static kind of environment, perhaps um, there would be a possibility to include live sound, uh, an instrument, a soloist, on stage and create something that's a little more interactive with the environment. That, in fact, is where I presented my first project called Chronotope. Chronotope stands for Chronos, Time, and Topos, space. So I'm very, very intrigued by time and space. Um, this is something that is omnipresent in my compositions, in my work. Here, for example, you have images of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, abstract images that were turning in the dome. It was actually quite spectacular for me to be sitting in a completely immersive environment, but also something that I created on my laptop on a very tiny screen that was, in fact, projected on a 23-meter diameter um, sphere or se a semi-sphere. So this is where the project um, Resonance Boreal started. At the same time, my brother, Roman Zavada, was starting an album project inspired by the Northern Lights, and we uh, thought it would be a good idea to work on a piano and sound design project together. And it eventually was called Resonance Boreal. So we worked from completely different places, northern and southern hemisphere, and on a project that would finally lead us to collaborate together uh, as brothers exploring uh, new forms of media, something we've been waiting for a long time. So equipped with his upright piano, he recorded some sounds inspired by the northern lights of Aurora Borealis. To this end, I'll show you a two-minute video.
this is an excerpt uh, that was actually created about two years ago when uh, Roman had a piano borrowed uh, near Yellowknife to go up in near the taiga where there is essentially nothing and he could, he could be inspired by the northern lights to compose his music and record sounds. That is where the dome comes in. Because when I saw the original uh, beginnings, the beginnings of his project, uh, I sort of put two to, and two together and started talking about this idea with directors and producers uh, that I met at the Full Dome Festival. In fact, I met one of them who was uh, from Montreal which is also intriguing because somehow the, there was a connection there, an immediate connection for me to be able to share uh, this sort of uh, interdisciplinary project with essentially um, uh, the, the, um, the, best, the best people I could uh, potentially work with in the future, involving uh, the top people uh, in the audio audiovisual industry. And this became a very ambitious and forward-looking project label, in fact, by the uh, news and the media as the DNA of the Montreal Festival of Lights in February this year. So this was, in fact, supposed to be a two-week show that ended up being a five-week show twice an evening. So it was actually quite popular. Um, this is the speaker configuration for the dome of the satosphere. So the satosphere is essentially a 20-meter dome and has 128 speakers, all in different levels, and four subwoofers. So here we have uh, levels A, B, B, C, C, D. In fact, A, B is this row to this row, so it's essentially a set of speakers, and they're actually grouped by four. So there are four speakers per, uh, per level. So in fact, you, we could easily say that there's one, two, three, four, perhaps five levels of speakers. And, um, the challenge, therefore, was to map um, the sound, the sound of the piano, to all of this collection of speakers. So, um, essentially, also, the other challenge was to incorporate a live instrument, not, to, not just to have a static, uh, a static uh, mix. So, in fact, the mix had to be uh, commensurate to the actual performer, not to drown the performer or for the piano to be overpowering the music. Uh, accompanying it. Um, so the balance between um, the solo instrument in the middle of the dome and to create an accom a convincing accompaniment for a blended sound providing the illusion of one immersive composition. There were many recording logistics that came into place so we decided to lease the best studio in town. And you can see by the console, it's a C2000 uh, SSL console. Um, the studio was located in um, CBC or Radio Canada, it's the equivalent of ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. So this was in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This basically is the Olympic flagship uh, studio recording facilities in Canada. And it's a multi-purpose uh, recording studio for both music and TV production with fantastic control room and a very versatile space to record rock bands, to record classical music, to record choirs, um, and for example, the setup for the project that I worked on in December. Uh, so we actually had the studio for nine full days to record. Um, it was actually quite interesting in this case because the aesthetics of the project lied somewhere between classical music and popular music. That was extremely important for the choice of microphones, the microphone placement, and how it would treat the sound later on. So the idea was to create a dome within that square space to then use that sound in the actual dome, but record it in a fashion that would um, simulate a dome environment. So in fact, being a world-class facility, microphones was not an issue. These are the type of microphones we used. There were actually 31 microphones to record two pianos. This has not been done before. Um, there was a, a real purpose for that. But as you can see here, there's um, quite interesting microphones. There are, are uh, Sennheiser MKH 800s. There are Neumann's, uh, Neumann tube microphones. There's a whole series of DPA omnidirectional microphones. 
In fact, uh, we used 31 in total, and if you actually compare the price of these mics, it totaled about $70,000 of just microphones. So that's one expense that we didn't have to do, of course, because it came with a studio. Uh, so we were lucky there. Here's the plan of the studio. Empty, and uh, the console we just saw before is that little, uh, that little rectangle. So you can imagine the wideness and the length of the space. It's a massive space. And here are the two pianos. One that was fully open, no cover, and the other one with the lid half open. This is the microphone setup. So the microphones you see in red um, is the first layer, closer to sort of the ears. And the blue microphones were the ones that are a level above, about four or five meters higher, to capture the resonance in the upper space. And the green ones were somewhere in between. You can see that, in fact, the setup was really a sort of an immersive way to record the instrument. Um, so in fact, it took a long time to set up this array of microphones. Um, there were several layers, as you can see. And we'll start talking about the actual recording session. Uh, what's interesting also is that there were no specific microphone techniques used. You can notice there, there the microphones are paired AB or ABC, so in three or in two but there weren't any specific um, recordings like ORTF or MS or other more specific recording techniques that are normally used, in fact, to record a piano. This was really ears and speakers and us making a decision, this sounds good and this sounds not so good. So basically, there was a lot of work there, especially with uh, beautiful pianos like the Steinways we had. They were actually tuned twice a day for this project. Because of the nature of the music, it was very percussive, the piano would go out of tune <laughs> within two or three hours. Um, so keeping in mind, if uh, we go back and forth, you look at these microphones and look at the dome setup. Um, so some of the sessions were extremely massive. Because of the very setup, imagine 31 microphones recording one piece, but imagine that the composer, my brother, had this piece in mind which was multi-layered. So some pieces had actually 19 overdubs. That's a total of 19 times 31, which is 589 tracks. So this was never done, in fact, in that computer in the studio. And the computer can only play back 256 tracks at a time. So basically, we completely went overboard, and we had to hide tracks, make some tracks inactive, in order to make some decisions. Now, one would say, why have so many tracks? Well. There was a very, very good reason for it, and we'll try to <clears throat> elucidate a few of those in a moment, but with audible examples. I made the computer crash, <clears throat> yes, and I know exactly why. I was actually tr tr trying to time stretch some sounds because timing was of extreme importance for this project, and I tried to drag the actual window session so immediately the, the computer crashed, but it only happened twice, so I'm very proud of that. I was using this very computer here that's on my desk. It's a Mac, the latest, uh, the latest um, Mac Pro that, um, in fact, uh, it would be impossible without the technology to realize a project with so many microphones and so many tracks, even a year ago. <laughs> so this is really at the uh, cutting edge of technology. I think now I can easily... Um, Start by playing an example, um, but before I do that, I'll just prepare a few slides still here. There's examples of micro timing. One of the most ama amazing things that I discovered with this project was, in fact, the true nature of music um, in, in all its intricacies, in all its micro details. Like every microsecond makes a difference in the feel of the rhythm, the feel of the music, the dynamics, the expression that comes out of the music. And it's all details that we don't really pay attention to if we listen or hear, watch a, a, a performer, for example, a pianist perform on stage. But when you actually see these recordings and, and the waveforms, and you start cutting and editing, putting all of these things together, and now imagine 19 tracks, 19 overdubs, it has to be perfect. So basically, that one particular piece took me one week just for the editing to, to be, um, well, 
audible, you know, to, sound, to start sounding like music. And then you have to do the mixing and balancing of microphones. So the microphones we will see in a moment. Um, I'll come back to this. I'll need to change softwares. The first example I will play is, in fact, um, one of the pieces. And I'm basically going through all the pairs of microphones, from the furthest one to the closest one on the first level, and again through the furthest one to the closest one on the higher level. So I'm hoping you'll be able to detect the difference. So there's a bit, bit of a click. I left it there on purpose. I didn't try to blend the track. So when there's a click, in fact, you'll uh, have a change of microphone pair. And hopefully you'll, you'll actually um, distinguish the difference between the various uh, types of microphones and the distance from the original sound. Well, the piano, distance from the piano. So now we're far away, yeah?
So you noticed the variety and the potential with the different microphones. There's no EQ, no reverb, no effects, just microphones by pair. So um, I think that's not me, no. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I, this is the extraordinary potential and listening also to, to exercise one's ears to, um, to actually listen to sound in such detail, to be able to distinguish between all these varieties, these colors, the, 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 the color of sound. So what happened after, I had all this choice. So there's a million possibilities. Um, I will actually... Master G, Master... I'll play the mix, in fact, of this piece. I won't play it entirely, but we'll see how far we can go. Um, there's a beep for the video. But... Now this is mixed with all the microphones combined. So he understood the concept <clears throat> that there's so many layers, but there's no effects really used for this. It's all just a choice of microphones, a balance between the 31, playing solo one, muting the others, and doing this for hours on end, trying to really find the perfect balance and the perfect emotion for that piece. That's a slow piece. There were other challenges during the project um, the main one, perhaps, uh, being so many tracks to deal with. And um, I'll just play an excerpt because it's actually, you cannot really listen and comprehend that music because all the tracks are playing at once. There's lots of clicks, there's lots of everything. But you have to compare what I was essentially starting with um, and the final result. <laughs>
was a bit chaotic. Um, and basically, this was a kind of a skeleton uh, template. But the final mix of that particular area, uh, you will soon discover clarity in all of this, and it, all will, it, it will all make sense. This is 19 overdubs, so lots of notes to micro time and edit. Um, my next exa example, in fact, can be uh, to compare the difference between the actual, this I, I apologize, need to take the volume a bit down at minus 22. I'll play one little section here just to demonstrate the mastered version, the actual commercial version because it's for broadcast uh, purposes for the radio and it sounds absolutely different than the mix I did. Um, essentially, here I'll even do a fade in. very different. It's full, it's rich, uh, it's constant, there's less dynamic range, it doesn't fluctuate as much. Um, but the biggest challenge was actually to create a surround version of pieces because then there was an actual an element of composition within the composition. Uh, so I'll open a session here that I've prepared, I'll mute the actual live piano. So this was created for piano and dome, basically. So perhaps I can even start with the specialization um, and see if it works. First of all, there's always a bit of a, yeah, I hear something in the back. That's the outer layer, the top layer. So that's the top layer. I'll play the second layer, sort of closer to the piano. If I play the actual piano itself, what the uh, musician is playing. So there's a lot more melody, there's a lot more melodic content. Now 
everything. intricacies are a lot more obvious with the surround version, I think. It's something extremely difficult to mix, especially when you don't know what you're mixing for, because I did the mixing here in the studios at the Sydney Conservatorium for the dome, which was in Montreal. So I had to essentially imagine myself in that dome. I created an 11.1 um, system, so 5.1 plus another six speakers. The six additional speakers were sort of for me like the additional layer and I kept sort of comparing and mixing and uh, basically I did a really nice mix, something that I was very happy with, sent it to the dome and the dome people said, ah, it sounds very bright because the dome reflected a lot of frequencies and there's a dome is sort of concentric. So in some spots there the frequencies appear a lot louder than in other spots within that circumference. So basically, with all the comments that came from the um, mixing and uh, directors there, I created a very bad mix here so that it would sound good over there. <laughs> and so that was another challenge, basically doing a little bit of EQing, but um, to fix the sound so that it would be, uh, that they would, it would blend with the actual piano, with the instrument as, as one piece, not as two separate entities. Um, we can close this session. Um, I have perhaps uh, one more thing to show and then a video. Um, in fact, it would be more interesting to start with this here. I'll play a video that is in a different format. It is obviously destined for a dome, but here it's a square, well, rectangular surface. Uh, we'll see what it looks like.
live video, it's not time lapse. It's actually uh, real footage, real video footage in 4, 4K, the highest resolution possible. And it's the first time, in fact, that a project was done uh, live, because normally uh, Aurora Borealis are actually photographed in time lapse to see them move. But this is um, actually truly the uh, uh, truly the Aurora as you would see them in the Great North. Um, And to finish, I'll just play um, just some of the specialization and sound design that was involved. That v? Just make sure. Oops, I did the wrong thing. I muted them. So I have 10 more years of work to do just on this project <laughs> because the possibilities are infinite. Um, there are so many tracks. We actually recorded a piece uh, just with sound effects which I wanted, for which I want to do a, an electroacoustic music piece with the same principle, um, perhaps not with the Aurora Borealis but with abstract images like I've done in the past. But we actually spent about three hours recording um, on the piano um, <clears throat> I'll show you, just to finish off, in fact, uh, some, some pictures, uh, some, a quick run, run through, this only takes one minute, but it's to show you, in fact, the um, microphone placements, <clears throat> the type of microphones, the producer and uh, director, the actual dome as it was recorded. Um, 
and the panels that you, that you see as well, the complexity of the marking placement, um, but also the tube um, amp, uh, the tube um, microphones with their actual tube amps, the really nice quality sounds. Those were the loudest one you've heard at the beginning, very close. Uh, this is the assistant uh, sound engineer going absolutely mad because there were too many tracks and he was getting lost in hiding things and finding them again. Um, this is my brother actually playing these sort of percussive sounds in the piano. And that's why, in fact, these microphones that you see above, they're actually facing away from the piano, which is extraordinary because normally you'd think they'll be facing the piano, but it was essentially capturing the resonance of the piano going upwards. So the, and it was the best sound. It was really, really sublime. Um, you see here we're at uh, measure 249, which means we've been tracking for quite a long time. Um, we were thinking about what on earth is he playing now? Which overdub is he in? Because <laughs> we need to organize the tracks. You can't just say, oh, now I want to play this part. In fact, you have to prepare. There's a lot of preparation for that as well. Um, lots of discussion. I was actually doing work in parallel while they were recording. I was doing all the time adjustments for the tracks so that then it would be easier for uh, the performer to play on top of the track, which was perfectly in time. So there was a kind of a chain work going on. We we're all working simultaneously. No one was actually sitting back and listening. We we're all very active in the process. Um, this is a close up even with, uh, you know, blue tack and things like that to put on strings so that they sound different. So there was a lot of effects that, was, that were created. We weren't able to put metal or anything like this on the Steinway. It was not allowed, but it was allowed to put blue tack. So we did the best we could with that. Um, finally, uh, yeah, this is the studio, the microphones and uh, the team, which uh, worked extremely well together. Uh, all the decisions were taken very promptly. Um, in fact, we all agreed on everything. It was a fantastic uh, production environment, a close up. Um, and yes, that concludes my presentation for this evening. And if you have any questions, please ask now. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Timing was an issue, and I used timing as uh, more of a reverb effect than an actual accompaniment effect. So I actually tried to minimize that um, discrepancy because it went up to, I think, 10 or 15 milliseconds, you know, in, in terms of the whole length. So timing was an issue, and it depended on the moment in the piece. That's why my little slide there on micro timing, I could talk about for an hour, because just that aspect, I actually did volume curves to have the, uh, the, the, the delay, the actual delay with the, the sound because it made it richer. And then when it became blurry, I took it out. So basically it was my own personal or aesthetic decision. Well, I'm waiting for the show to come to Australia next year for me to actually hear it in a dome in Melbourne, at least, because we don't have a planetarium, unfortunately, in Sydney, but there is one in um, Melbourne, Perth, and um, yeah, I think the show, in fact, in two weeks' time, the reason I showed you the slides of the Yenna um, planetarium was, in fact, that my brother was invited to perform in two weeks' time at the Yenna planetarium. So that's where the project started, with my casual conversations with producers and directors. And uh, two years later, he's actually playing with a complete project. 
I wish I, I, I wish I could have, but I had to start teaching. <laughs> My semester started and also I was too busy. I was actually working about 10 hours a day for two months nonstop, including Sundays and Australia Day. I had a deadline to meet. The first deadline was the CD, the actual production of the CD. And the second deadline was the surround show in the, plan in the uh, satosphere or in the planetarium. So I was working nonstop and then I started teaching here on the 1st of March or 2nd. <laughs> A question. Uh, those names are in French, uh, but they're mainly linked with um, auroras, yeah, and dreaming. Uh, Capteur de rêve, for example, is dream catcher. Uh, they're all names linked with the Great North, with the sort of more, you know, the mysterious Great North and the Inuit tradition. Because you saw the rock at the beginning, it's like a, almost like a person, yeah. Yes, it's a live show. Uh, I'm not here to promote the CD, but it's on iTunes and uh, under the name Roman Savada. But uh, it's on iTunes. The CD is mastered. It's, it's already on the market. There's actually a, a physical copy of the CD, I, I, which I haven't seen either. But it's on iTunes and Spotify, believe it or not. Um, yes. No, for the CD, you need two speakers because the CD is purely designed for a stereo diffusion. I am very lucky this evening, and I would like to thank also the, the, um, my helpers, you know, Jared Salmon and uh, Jonathan Palmer to record, and also the conservatorium, because the speakers we have here are of uh, extremely high quality. So I was able to make a few tests this afternoon for it to sound as optimally as I could, but you know, it, it will take me a week to do. <laughs> Uh, he had headphones, um, and there was one piece with a click track that had to modify a bit because, the, as you saw, the, there was a lot of rubato, a lot of the rhythm was changing constantly. So he did the click track. Uh, well, we did it together, in fact, um, with a MIDI, just sort of a basic MIDI track. But we needed that because it was too complicated because of the overdubs. I mean, the biggest one was 19 but other ones had normally 10 overdubs. Uh, some of them didn't need a click track because it was like tremolo effect. So, you know, you could place a tremolo wherever you wanted to. But, um, and in the meantime, I used a lot of time stretching uh, to really align the things so that they're really in beat, really in sync. And that's why I was working in that little extra room uh, intensively to, uh, to get the session going because it's quite expensive, you know, by the hour to, <laughs> for the studios. Any other questions? So thank you very much, and thank you, Matthew, for the well, invitation. Thank you very much, Ivan. I think you'll agree it's an amazing uh, quality of sound, and uh, what an experience to, to not just do the, the so many speakers, but also those different versions. And taking into account, I was just thinking, all things, taking into account like the, the timing and how they fit together for the different versions, and even I'm sitting here, I'm getting this speaker. <laughs> It's all relative, yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much, Yvonne. Thank you.